Okay. Okay, well, why we have a lot on this agenda. So let's call the November meeting of the Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District to order. Uh, this meeting is being recorded uh, for the record and I am going to call the roll. Uh, so you need to verbally let uh, the record know you're here. That'd be great. So uh, Ann Gravett. Bob Salinger. Lori Stegman. She will not be attending from my understanding today. Oh, okay. Thank you. Corky Collier. Here. Dave Ritma. Here. Mike Weatherby. Shirley Craddock. Eric Molander. Here. James Allison. Here. Uh, John Niyama. John L. Bell. Mary Helen Kincaid. Paul Lumley. Good afternoon. I'm here for the first uh, 30 minutes and the last 30 minutes, but I'll miss the middle part. Sorry. <laughs> OK. Uh, Steve Fancher. Here. Tanny Staffenson. Here. Tony DeFalco. I believe he will also be absent. OK. And. Um, John Niyama, um, Mary Helen Kincaid, uh, Ann Gravett, and I believe Bob Salinger and uh, Councillor Weatherby joined while you're doing the role. Um, oh, so okay. Well, also... I joined as Jim. Okay, so Mary Helen's here. Uh, Ann Gravett? Yeah, Mike? I don't know if you can hear me. I lost my, my audio. Uh, I'll have to uh, find we, out afterwards what happened. We can hear you, Mike. Okay, Bob Salinger. Hi, sorry. No, yes, no got it. Bob Salinger, out of on. Great. <clears throat> uh, Johnny Amma. And did you say John L. Bell joined? No. No. Okay. Well, I think that's everybody. Is there anybody I miss? Didn't call? Val Humble, visiting member of the public, just, just dropped in. Well, I'm sorry. We don't allow that, Val. <laughs> <laughs> and you better I'm not send out the link. Glad, glad you're here. Thank you. Okay, what's first on the agenda, gang? I don't have it in front of me. I have your smiling faces in front of me. So. Oh, are you gonna put that up, please? Uh, first thing is we're gonna be covering the bylaws. Okay. Excellent. Um, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna be um, another riveting section of bylaws this afternoon. Um, the section we're covering today is on financial management. Um, so Colin, if you could skip to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this section covers audit requirements, um, execution of contracts and other documents, loans and checks and deposits. Um, and so these are all kind of really important <coughs> components of um, kind of the financial management. Um, and any ability of the district to um, bind itself via contracts and loan agreements and things like that. Um, so the first section on the audit basically outlines audit requirements under the law um, and just makes clear that the urban district is subject to Oregon Municipal Audit Law, um, which is found in ORS 297. The next section um, regarding execution of contracts 
Um, so this authorizes the board to delegate um, contract signing and instrument execution authority. Um, and as it's written, the authorized parties include um, the executive director and then other designated officer or officers. And um, in the future, you will see a proposed slate of signers um, that we've suggested to um, be able to bind the district uh, via contracts. Um, and then it, otherwise, if it hasn't been specifically designated, then that authority would rest with the chair. Um, and other than that, the no signing authority has been delegated. So that's retained by the board, um, that anything that hasn't been specifically outlined uh, via resolution. Uh, the next section is on loans. And so um, the board, it, uh, the way that it's written, the board would have to give authority prior to any borrowing taken on by the district. Um, and then in addition, the, any real or personal property owned by the district may be used as security and collateral for a loan. Um, and then in this section, it designates that any instruments pertaining to the loan would be signed. I can't get any audio. I'll just watch. Yeah, and so I have to. By the chair. Um, Uh, and, and that includes any uh, any instruments that would pertain to a loan, including um, notes, mortgages, I'll try. Yeah, that's a and pledges. The next section is on checks and deposits, um, and so this just kind of describes generally how funds will be kept in accordance with the applicable law and with any board policy that the board chooses to pass in the future. Um, it just kind of generally states that um, we will keep the books correctly and that um, if, if funds are required to be kept in designated separate accounts that they will do so. And it also authorizes delegation of signing authority um, for checks and deposits, which again, you'll see in a, a proposed resolution of um, that slate of signers. Um, and, and, and so when Janet addresses this later on, we'll also talk about kind of the practice of the current boards in terms of how we keep funds in designated checking versus investment accounts. Um, and this just kind of authorizes those practices. Um, and then of course, in the absence of any designation of particular signers of checks and deposits, um, the instruments will be signed by the chair. Um, so that's kind of a lot on finances and um, contracting authority. Are there questions on those sections? Kelly, Kelly, this is Mary Helen. I'm having a hard time clicking buttons. Um, my only question is, is, and I know that you've consulted with special districts, are there any deviations that are in this for us or we're just pretty standard? I mean, I, I, I guess it, that revolves around um, if there's anything that someone that's not a legal mind um, needs to pay attention to or because uh, I just support not deviating a whole lot or, you know, um, so that we don't have issues ahead that we can't foresee. Yeah, so um, th this is all pretty standard in terms yeah. of that we're not um, exempting anything um, outside of what the law requires. Um, okay. There is some wiggle room here for there to be, um, you know, in, in terms of that some boards have investment policies and things like that, that they ascribe to. Um, but we've just tried to keep everything really uh, transparent and clear in the way that it's written and kind of leaving room for those uh, more specific policies to be developed later. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, Kelly. Okay, um, and so I think the next slide, Colin, is just kind of a, um, originally we had intended to bring the balance of uh, prior suggestions and additions from prior meetings to this uh, meeting, but it, it got to be kind of long. Um, and so instead of kind of cramming that <laughs> into your brains in this meeting, um, those are prepared and they'll be uh, ready to go uh, for your review in December. Okay. 
Um, is it is it a lot? Are there a lot of suggested changes or alterations? Or? Uh, no, I would say that there was probably one or two requests per okay. meeting. Um, and so hopefully I've addressed all of them um, in this sort of final draft version. Um, yeah, we can go from there. And this will come out in the regular package so everybody will have a chance to look at it. But uh -huh. we're expecting that anyone would be very surprised by what's coming as the whole, the whole document, right? Correct, yes. And it will be sent in track changes form. Um, in addition to some of the suggestions and um, inquiries for clarification, there are just some editorial things, you know, uh, mistakes in the prior versions, but all of that will be redlined. Okay, great. Any other questions of Kelly before we move on? Kelly, thank you. Mm -hmm. So what's next? Contracting options. Contracting, yes. More riveting administrative tasks for your consideration. Uh, my presentation today will just preview some issues for you um, and um, sort of lay the fame framework for a number of procurements that are coming up in, um, in this meeting and subsequent meetings. So we thought that uh, instead of just throwing and recommending procurement contracts for you to adopt that, it might be good to provide some overview for this board uh, with respect to um, some preliminary considerations and, and these contracting options that I'm gonna be discussing really deals with primarily procurement uh, contracts uh, under the public procurement law. So uh, if you don't mind, Colin, uh, jump to the next screen. And uh, it basically lays out really very, for the infancy phase of this district uh, as we sit today, given the limited rules that we have, limited uh, budget that we, uh, money that we can spend, um, this chart kind of lays out two strategic path um, that this district can take in terms of the type of procurement procedure um, it, it can follow. And um, one is to take on a contract in the name of the district itself. And that would be the, I guess, the far left box there where the, the urban district would be just uh, contracting as its own contracting party. Um, and uh, it would be serving as the local contract review board to uh, administer any uh, local contracting rules that, that it adopts. Um, with respect to those contracting rules, uh, if it's going to do it in its own name, it can either follow the Department of Justice model rules or adopt its own local contracting rules. And, and I'll get into that a little later. The alternative is that it does uh, the contracting in the name of the JCA, where the JCA is the contracting board party and serving as the local contracting board for the benefit of the urban district. And this is, uh, would need to be authorized under the JCA service agreement. Um, in that case, if you are going to be using the JCA as your contracting party, you would be using the JCA contracting, uh, local contracting rules. And they would be serving as your local contracting board. For example, if there is a dispute over uh, uh, in uh, like if there is a competitive bid and some of the vendors uh, dispute uh, the procurement process, the JCA would be serving as the board to resolve those issues rather than the urban district. So those are your two options. And so what drives these two options? Next slide, please. Uh, there are several factors that decides for you what, which pocket uh, you, you should or could um, fall into in terms of who's going to contract for you. The first, the first obviously is the source of the money. If, if we're relying and expending just urban district boards funds, for example, the 40,000 grant that's coming from the drainage districts and the forthcoming uh, 123,000 from the LRC, that's the kind of fund that you, um, you can use to enter into contracts in the name of the urban district for the urban district. The other source of the funding is obviously the $500,000 grant from the, from the Oregon grant. At the moment, that's the biggest funds available to the urban district. And as such, that needs to be um, contracted in the name of the JCA following 
the JCA service agreement as well as the Business Oregon grant agreement. And then there's a possibility of some mixed mix funds where if there's a, a procurement that requires funding from both the $500,000 grant and the urban district source, that that's a, another factor to decide which um, entity should be doing the contracting. Uh, a, a secondary factor is, is really what rules do you want to apply? And here, um, as, as most of you are familiar with public contracting rules, or, or maybe not, um, the model rules follow you know, these standard state procedures for um, exemptions uh, from uh, competitive procurement. We have an ability as a, as a local contracting board to adopt rules that move that uh, competitive re uh, requirements around a bit. For example, uh, we can decide that we, won't, uh, we don't need to go through a competitive bid for contracts, uh, for certain types of contracts, if certain criteria are followed. Or you can delegate to Peggy and her team signing of the contracts if they are under a certain amount of money. So for example, the local, uh, the JCA local contracting rules gives Peggy authority to sign any contracts under $100,000. Anything above that need to go back to the, the board for approval. The other factor is the timing of the needs with respect to that contract. Is there an immediate need for that procurement today, six months from now or years from now? If it's today and the money is, um, we're expending money from the urban district, then maybe we go through the JCA as your contracting authority. If the needs is a, a week from now, but the money needs to come from the urban district, then, then um, you would have the urban district be your contracting authority. So Colin, if you move to the next slide, this lays out for you at least some contracting options that are allowed or not allowed strategically in terms of where the money is coming from and when you would need to, to uh, uh, or I guess there's no timing issue here, but um, if in the first box, um, you're using the urban district funds and you want the urban district to be the contracting authority, um, you could do that and you would follow the model rule. If the project is a year from now and you want to adopt certain exemptions uh, for your local contracting rules, then we would work with you to develop your own set of contracting rules to adopt later. But for the time being, I think to the extent that um, uh, it's advisable, if you can spend all the money uh, the, as much as you can with the $500,000 grant, you would want to use the JCA. You would need to use the JCA as your contracting authority and using, uh, they would be running the, the contracting procurement process for you. So here, um, the boxes lay out for you what is permissive and what needs to, to happen in order for that to occur. So for example, uh, with respect to the um, contracting uh, by the urban district, where the urban district is using its fund and as a contracting party, we need to have an accounting system in place to make the payments. Now, Sunny's gonna come to you uh, in a few minutes to talk about um, retaining a financial uh, advisor that will be executed in the name of the urban district for the urban district. And um, that is just a, a proposal to, to move on a procurement, but there's no need to pay them as my understanding yet until the loan is procured. So, um, so we, we won't need an accounting system in place uh, for that procurement to move forward. Um, it is not permissive for the urban district to uh, be contracting in, in its name for itself uh, using the, the $500,000 business grant from Oregon. Um, if there's a mixture of the grant and urban district fund, um, we suggest that that be contracted through the JCA rather than uh, through the urban district, just because of the uh, controlling aspect of the business Oregon IGA. So with that, um, that is my 15 minutes of uh, very high level procurement uh, contracting options for this district in, in its current very infant, infancy phase. Um, we will be back 
to you all later on as we further, uh, as you further mature as a district to develop your own set of local contracting rules and, um, and serve as your own uh, contracting board, review board and uh, contracting party. So with that, um, I'll open up for questions. If not, we'll move on to another contract issue. So any questions for Hong right now? And, and Hong, just so I'm clear, you've given us this presentation to give us kind of a framework as we start to think about the things that are coming at us. Yes. <laughs> Within the next few minutes, actually. Yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, and so there's no, no decision to be made per se right now with this. This is a framework for people to think about as they're considering these other issues coming. Yeah, it's 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 for that, and it uh, there is no decision point with respect to this presentation. Um, okay. There will be it, it it is advising you on the framework and your options as you contemplate uh, forthcoming decisions with respect to procurement uh, requests that are going to be made. Thank you. Mike, I do have a question about this. What is the major difference between the JCA local rules and the model rules? Great question. So uh, the there, it, it, one includes the delegation of signing authorities uh, from you know the the contract I was mentioning from one um, hundred thousand dollars and under is authorized for the district the executive director or her team to sign just so that we don't keep coming back to you with agreements to for authorization. The other is defining what personal services agreements are um, permissive, uh, what mm -hmm. kind of personal appointment or direct appointment that could be made, what's the value uh, uh, in the contract value that allows for you to make those personal appointments without having to go through competitive procurement uh, procedures. So it will uh, recognize some of those exemptions and define some of those exemptions so that um, the districts can can procure contracts in a legal way, in a competitive way, uh, but with great efficiency and, um, and um, results. And so to the extent that um, this district will be at a point where it's ready to consider those local contracting rules, we would be working with you proposing what, what we currently have, walk through that with you and then rely uh, really on sort of the, the vast experience of this group and their public procu uh, procurement experience to advise us if there are anything else that this particular district's need uh, for its own local rules as compared to those uh, that have been used by the drainage districts all these years. So basically it means that the model rules tend to be a little bit more restrictive and uh, the local rules tend to be much more efficient uh, because they give a, a looser definition of personal services. Okay. It's, it's how it's, yeah, that's how we have, uh, we have adopted our version of local rules. Now there could be other districts where they've decided to make the local rules more restrictive. And uh, just so I'm clear, the JCA rules are the rules that the four drainage districts currently work under. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions before we start to put this into practice? <laughs> I, I would just, uh, it just seems like everything leans toward the JCA being the contracting authority and there's no no point in even discussing it further, as far as I'm concerned. Well, thanks for cutting to the chase, Dave. <laughs> Just an observation. I mean, everything is that way. So. Well, I think that's a really good comment, Dave, except for um, uh, this upcoming um, procurement that Sunny is going to present on. And I'll just uh, do a brief preview on that is it's, it's a procurement to hire a financial advisor to uh, pursue a line of credit with uh, banks. And so when we go through underwriting on that, I am not sure that the creditor is gonna want to see this procurement um, signed by the JCA for the JCA, but the, the debtor is the urban district. I'm not sure that the underwriting 
uh, process would, would allow for that. So we decided that um, for that particular contract, it'd be best to have it in the name of the urban district. So it will be dependent on the type of contracts, but you're right to the extent that it's, it's a contract that we, that we know that the vendor will be okay with using the JCA as the contracting authority, we would absolutely do recommend that you allow us to do that. Okay, thank you, Hong. It's a good question, Dave. Um, anything else before we move on? Okay. I'm just gonna jump in to note that uh, John L. Bell is present and joined the meeting at 3.05. Welcome, John. Great. Thank you. Great, okay. Kelly? Yeah, so um, me again, hi. Um, this should be relatively quick and painless. Um, staff is proposing this first amendment to the JCA and Urban District Services IGA. Um, Colin, if you could pop to the next slide. Um, so uh, JCA and urban, the Urban District signed a services IGA um, so that we can provide staffing with MCDD as a subcontractor. That was effective in August. Um, and at the same time, the JCA had received this $500,000 grant to spend on behalf of the urban district. Um, and so recently um, we discussed with MCDD and uh, they agreed to charge 0% overhead for work that's associated with that grant in order to maximize how far we can take that the grant money. Um, and so what this amendment does is memorialize those rates, um, which are I think called attachment A in the IGA. Um, just to represent that 0% overhead um, to, and that will cover work done from March 11th through June 30th. So basically from March 11th and then through the end of this fiscal year to cover um, the work that's done under that grant. Um, and so in your packet, it shows the rates in there. Um, and so that reflects basically our actual um, staff rates and our, um, there shouldn't be any equipment rates in there, um, or at least none that are necessary at this time. So um, any questions about adding that attachment to your services IGA with JCA? Are there questions? Colin, I think if you, there may be one more slide. Yes, I had one. Just the, okay, go ahead. Um, in the agreement, we, we re reference um, MCDD and its members. Uh, J uh, JCA has members, not MCDD. Let's see. Okay. Talking about what we're charging members. I didn't see members anywhere else. Uh, can you let me know, or do, do you have a page number where that's located? Let's, I guess I can do a search here. Yeah, okay, so the term members is, it just applies to the parties to the JCA, and that's what they're called in the ordinance that created the JCA, so that's the reason for that. Okay, and are the rates the same as what the districts are paying now? So the rates um, that are shown in the attachment A, and this is found on page uh, nine in your packet, um, is the rate sheet with attachment A. So in, in that rate sheet, there's two columns. There's one that reflects a 45.76% overhead, which is what we normally charge for service IGAs. Um, so for example, the Port of Portland, that's what MCDD charges uh, them for services that we provide through an IGA. Um, and then this other column uh, re reflects the rates without overhead. Um, and so each of these is a range um, because depending on which staff member might be working on something, uh, it, it may be a different rate. Um, this also helps us to kind of build in contingency for, um, you know, mid-year increases and things like that so that we're covered um, no matter what the, the actual rate is. But that's what you will be charged is the actual rate without overhead for the individual staff member. Um, and so the rate that's applied to the districts to, so to Pen 1, Pen 2, Sandy, um, in those IGAs is about 27% overhead. And the reason why that's lower than our normal IGA 
overhead um, is because it reflects the um, efficiencies we think occur um, from providing service to those other districts, um, since there's a lot of overlap in some of the services that we provide. And the, uh, and the, and the rates, Kelly, that are listed there without overhead are fully loaded compensation rates, right? Not just Correct. salary. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Other questions? exactly the same, correct? The base rates are the same. Yeah. Yeah. And then just MCDD has approved these three different overhead rates based on that, you know, for various situations. Okay. Um, and what is the actual overhead rate? Do we know? Uh, that would be probably a Casey short question unless I know Janet's on the call, but I don't know if she has that um, I think the last time that we um, approved this overhead rate was several mm -hmm. years ago, and I don't know if we have looked at that. Kelly? Yeah. Are you talking about the current overhead rate right now? Mm hmm We're charging the districts 27.39. And I, Tani, is your question whether that accurately reflects overhead, or, or were you just wondering the 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 rates? Well, we've got a 47, 45.76 and a 27.39. So I guess my question is, um, where does that blended rate come in? What is the actual rate of the overhead? So we're charging based on what we're going to get, what MCDD is going to get back, correct? To cover its costs? Correct. Yeah. So I'm just wondering what that, what is that number? Janet, do you wanna take that? Yeah. I guess I'm trying to kind of understand exactly what Tani's asking, but the 45.76%, that is our federal um, overhead rate that was approved through ODOT. So that one is a whole different calculation. Um, and it can only be, MCDD is the only one that has the authorization for that rate. And it's only to be used for other federal or other agencies, uh, the Port of Portland, uh, City of Portland for any special projects. It's not the regular service that we do for them, but special projects. Um, the 27.39, that's the overhead calculation that takes into account um, office space, computers, um, you know, administrative time, that sort of thing. Uh, Casey has a whole calculation that he does every year based on previous year's budget. Or the 27. Correct. That's the 27.39, yes. And he follows the, um, there are regulations about how you come up with that overhead rate. He follows that with the guidelines. Okay. I, I'm just, so the 45 is a contract rate um, that we would do for contracts. And it seems like that's going to be the same rate we're charging for ongoing services, right? Am I getting that right? No, that we would be. The 45.76 is the, it's the federal rate, overhead rate calculation. Mm -hmm. And we, I don't believe that the urban flood district, I'm not sure exactly where they would apply that. Okay. At this time. At this time. At this okay. time. We would not. That's what it's saying that the overhead is going to be. So <laughs> just trying to understand. It's that if we had a, say an IGA and did a special project, possibly for the Port of Portland or something else that we would be, if the urban flood district was authorized to charge that, then they could apply that for a special project. Only. Generally, that's how it is established. Okay. Generally. Okay. Are there other questions?
So I think we have a recommended motion here to adopt this resolution, the, uh, the First Amendment to the IGA uh, with the uh, JCA. Anybody want to take a shot at this motion? It's on the screen right now. If, if not, is there more? Are there more questions or discussion? I'll read the motion. I just couldn't click the buttons. Um, <laughs> I move to adopt resolution 2020-11-03, approving a First Amendment to the Intergovernmental Agreement for support for the Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District, number GCA-2006-044-IGA. Second. I second that. Is there a second? Thank you, Mary Helen. It's been moved and seconded. Thank you, Tani. Any further discussion or questions? We probably need a roll call on this, don't we? Oh. Pardon? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Colin, do you have a, the list of who is here and who isn't? I may have missed a couple. Alan? Mm -hmm. You have the list? Uh, yes, here we go. Uh, Ann Gravitt? Yes. Bob Salinger? Yes. Corky Collier? Yes. Councillor Ripma? Yes. Councillor Weatherby? Might not be able. He saw him pop up, but might not be able to hear it. Uh, Eric Molander. Yes. James Allison. Yes. John Yama. Yes. John L. Bell. Yes. Mary Helen Kincaid. Yes. Mike Jordan. Yes. Paul Lumley. Paul made oh, and he had to drop off after the, yeah, he'll be back in the second half. Um, Steve Fancher. Steve was on. I mm -hmm. uh, can't see if he's on, but, uh, and Tanny Saffinson. Yes. I see he's still on, but I haven't, I don't know if he's having challenges there. So I think we have, yes, enough to, for the motion to pass. Appreciate that. Um, what's next? Is this the financial advisor? Yes. Okay. Oh, I think my slide didn't get in there, it looks like. But, oh. Um, but that's okay. Oh, there uh, we go. Uh, <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. So as we're all aware of, the, um, we only have funding secured for the district through this fiscal year, so through June 30th of 2021. So to be able to build a budget for next year and maintain the momentum for the new district, we need to secure some additional funding. We currently are um, asking the Oregon legislature for $2 million but we won't have an answer about that until late summer. So with that, the budget shortfall committee last meeting recommended that we pursue a commercial line of credit or loan from a, from a bank to meet these funding requirements. So when we've done, when we've secured loans or lines of credit previously at MCDD, we've used a financial advisor to help us do that. This advisor is able to... Hi, uh, you reached the voicemail of Pratt and Jetty Home Service. This, uh, this advisor is able to reach out to their contacts, their lenders um, that they know, tell our story, find out the information um, that we will need to provide to them to, to give us a really good um, 
proposal that's clear, transparent, and works for both us and the lender. In addition, when we get these, um, these proposal back from lenders, they're a lot more nuanced than um, I would expect personally. And so it's really helpful to have um, somebody who, who does this regularly discuss the pros and cons of payment terms and um, when rates change and all that. So, Thanks a lot. So for example, last year when we secured the MCDD line of credit for our um, capital program, the first time I'd done that, I expected it to be similar when I go out and get a mortgage where it's really straightforward, where you, you get you know, your fee structure and then your base percentage rate. And so it should be simple to compare versus from the five different lenders we received proposals from, there was you know, different rates based on payment terms and you know, all these different complicated things. So our financial advisor was able to break those all down for us and help us decide that. So we are a small staff also and with none of us um, having significant experience securing debts. And so it is really important to have um, that outside consultation to do that um, as we move forward with the funding structure. So with that, um, we are recommending that the board authorize us to bring on a financial advisor to help us secure this loan. This procurement well, process. Line of credit. Or well, line, we, line of credit. Said, we said line of credit and loan mm -hmm. in case a line of credit doesn't happen. We don't have to come back to you all. We can just keep moving forward as and keep you informed. Yeah. And so this process is actually exempted from, from procurement, um, from competitive process. But because this is so important, um, we do want to solicit bids from three different advisors to understand their expertise and then also their fee structure so we can get um, the most advantage, advantageous terms for ourselves um, in this process. So what the next steps for this is that we would like authorization to move forward with bringing on this financial advisor and um, we would solicit bids from three people that have been recommended to us. We get them and evaluate them on their fees and their experience. And then we would bring back a recommendation um, to this board on the December 21st meeting. So are there any, oh, go ahead. And I was just gonna add one of the things when talking to some advisors prior to, um, to this point, one of the recommendations was to, for us to go out with maybe two different kinds of packages. One being that if we did not have financial guarantee on the loan and also to do it if we had had some guarantee on the loan. And so it gives us a better understanding. Anyone would deduce that we, it would cost us more in interest if we don't have a guarantee, but at least provides us an idea of what, what our challenges are and also provide us a mechanism to have a conversation with potential guarantors in the region that, could, that would back us up and be able to give them an understanding of the costs saved with a um, guarantor of the, loan, of the line of credit. Yeah, and I think, Though the other factor I wanted to bring up in it is that we wouldn't, um, we would expect to pay for these services out of the line of credit themselves. So there wouldn't be um, an impact to the current, you know, to the budget as is for these services. We wouldn't pay until we receive that money is generally how it's structured. So I wanted to check in out there if there's any questions so far yeah. regarding the proposal. So yes. Sunny, what is the, uh, what's the anticipated uh, fee for these kinds of services? So what, what we've seen in the past, and um, it will depend on the amount we are going out for, was, was around a 1% fee of the total line of credit we're getting. Um, we were hope, doing this competitively, we hope um, that we get closer to maybe a half percent or three quarters of a percent. Okay, and then the the uh, what we'll do is we'll just gross up the amount of the line of credit to be able to cover the fee, correct? We can evaluate uh, which way which way we want to go on that. If we want to 
gross up or if we want to um, just take it out of the total amount we're receiving. Sunny, I have two questions. Um, one is, so it doesn't, there is no expense until, um, you know, we're actually seeking the line of credit, but is there any charge against the 500,000 for this? Like, will there be staff time charge? Are we reducing the 500,000 in any way by moving forward with this right now? Yes, our staff time, you know, spending time working with the financial advisor to write the RFP. So in that case, um, why not wait until the uh, CFO is hired because, um, <laughs> great hair. That's awesome. Why not wait until the CFO is on, on the one, the new um, staff person may actually have some of the skill set that you're seeking. Um, and two, I'm just, I'm concerned about anything that keeps kind of whittling away the 500,000 as we're unsure of what the financial future is versus, um, so anyways, that's my concern about the timing of needing to do it now and spending staff time on now when at the same time you're hiring a CFO. Yeah, so the schedule is really critical on this. Um, we need to have an adopted budget by May 15th for the Tax Conservation Supervisory Commission. Um, and, and so we've, we've kind of calculated it out and we need to have basically responses from the bank really in mid-March for us to be able to make those decisions and get the budget approved by May 15th. And so it will take us around a month, you know, to procure these services and, um, and then go out for the RFP after um, immediately, you know, to do that. So if we waited until we had a CFO till early January, that would push out probably the bids back from the banks um, until mid to late April, which would be really hard um, to adopt a budget by May 15th. So meaning we will, no matter what, we will be pursuing this line of credit even before we know what the legislature is gonna do? versus after the legislature acts? It, it's unlikely that you'll know what the legislature will do with this until probably mid-June. But you certainly won't know before mid-May when the forecast comes out. So, um, you know, uh, something like this often ends up in a Christmas tree bill at the very end. Uh, but I, I would say it's just, it's a very low percentage that you'll know about this before mid-May when you get last forecast that the budget, biennial budget's based on, especially in these kind of volatile revenue times. So. Yeah, I guess I'm just, I, I completely understand the legislative calendar. I'm, I'm unclear on the moving forward with a line of credit before we know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily have to take money from the line of credit. That, that the issue is, because I would advise not drawing on the line of credit until you know. You have money for this fiscal year, theoretically to get us through June 30th. So I know all those dates start to merge, but uh, I think what the staff is recommending is the sooner we have some certainty about our ability to get a line of credit, the better. I would suspect that they wouldn't recommend drawing on the line of credit until we need to. And if in fact we get $2 million out of the legislature mid-June, um, we wouldn't have to draw on the line of credit at all, potentially. Yeah. Or at least for the next year. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that's important is we're going out with an RFP for the financial advisor at this point. We don't anticipate getting anyone on board until, I mean, we're gonna bring back to you all some of the proposals and then we would select um, the appropriate financial advisor. And that will coincide with when the new CFO is anticipated to be on board, which is in January. 
So it's not like there's, this just keeps things moving along and gets us ahead. And that person um, could easily be able to provide some additional services that's, that other staff are currently doing. Uh, I give you a oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Eric. No, go ahead, Corky, and then I'll ask a question. Uh, I, I was just going to kind of reinforce it. You know, Anne brings up good points, uh, um, and I completely understand the timeline. I agree with the plan that staff is proposing there. Uh, my suggestion or my comment is simply to uh, make sure we don't accidentally slip down a slope we didn't mean to go down. Um, so uh, keep in mind the timing of all of this that as we bring a new CFO on board, if they are able to take the place of a consultant, a financial advisor, um, then we scrap those plans and save ourselves a little bit of money. You know, uh, let's just make sure we don't end up accidentally kind of going down a path we didn't need to go down. Mm -hmm. Eric, did you have a question? Yeah, it's, it's really on um, the path forward for this. Uh, it's pretty clear with our balance sheet and our funding model that we're going to have to have a guarantee uh, that there are very few to no commercial lending institutions that would look at our balance sheet and say, yeah, you're credit worthy for $2 million. We've got $40,000 in the bank and no real funding model for the next fiscal year. So if we're going, we really need to start this process by recognizing we're going to have to have a guarantee until we get something from the legislature and just deal with it that way. So if the, if the staff is suggesting that we, we use this financial advisor to assist us in identifying who should be that guarantor, that's going to be money really well spent. I don't disagree. Um, other questions and, or comments at this point? I would just echo what Eric said. I think, you know, we're going to have to have one of the big kids step up and guarantee this. Um, but also, too, this is not something we're going to draw on unless it's absolutely necessary. Sonny? What action do you need from this board at this point? I think we just need general agreement um, to authorize us to move forward with the solic solicitation with the caveat that we will bring this back to you in December 21st on your board meeting. And that's where you'll make a motion. And that's your schedule is to bring back the alternatives and a recommendation mm -hmm. on December 21st? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, it, unless I hear objection, uh, I'd, I'd allow staff to move forward on that line. It makes sense yeah. to me. Yep, hearing none, go for it, Sonny. Let's, we'll see you on the 21st. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next is the authorization uh, or authorities, financial authorities resolution, right? Janet? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, for you that have never met me before, I'm Janet Olson and I'm the finance manager with MCDD. So next slide. Thank you. Um, we have identified the need for authorization and delegation of the financial transactions to advance the organization of the urban flood district. That would be check signing, the opening checking and investment accounts with the bank and LGIP, and the possibility of opening up a credit card account at a later date. Um, public entities must meet the financial requirements of the RS 294 and 295. Next slide, Colin. Thanks. So the recommendations that staff is making is that 
for us to get authorization from the board to open the checking account through First Interstate Bank, which is the bank that all the other districts are using right now, and to authorize, <clears throat> Uh, authorize all deposits and transfers. Um, also to open a local government investment pool, which is referred to as the LGIP. Um, that is where we would keep the main pool of money um, and that would earn a rate of refund or a rate of return for funds not needed immediately. Um, the LGIP is managed by the Oregon State Treasury and the Oregon Short-Term Fund. Um, I guess open a credit card to make smaller purchases for the urban flood district and to delegate authority to transfer funds between accounts um, to the board chair, the executive director of the urban flood district and the JCA, and then also certain finance staff. So what we are recommending is for, um, for the checking accounts. Currently, the other districts have um, all checks, 5,000 and over, require two signatures. So we are looking, we're, we are um, asking for basically the same type of um, authorizations and format as the other districts to keep things a little bit simple. So district checks up to $10,000 um, would be two mm -hmm. signatures one signature for up to 5,000, anything over 5,000 would be two signatures and it would consist of one board member and either an executive director or a deputy director through MCDD. I think it would be helpful if Colin uh, jumps to the next slide because I think it's laid out in the next slide. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, district checks. $25,000 and over would always be one of the executive, well, the executive director of either the urban flood or the JCA and one of the selected board members. Transfer of funds between investment accounts and checking account, which is, we only carry so much money into our regular checking accounts. And then as we need it, we transfer from the LGIP over into the checking account. So, the people that would be authorized for that would be the um, board chair. And then MCDD staff would be the finance manager. That is myself. If I am not available, the MCDD district accountant under the supervision of the JCA executive director or the urban flood executive director. <clears throat> Any questions so far? That you, Tanny. <laughs> um, so, for the two signings, can it be the JCA executive director and the MCDD executive director? Well, it's the same person right now. No, um, normally we don't ever have two of, like, say, the. I guess it could be if they were two different people. Yes. If, if they were two different people, they'd have to be two different people. But we always want to make sure that you have it broken up so that there's a checks and balance here with the urban flood board and then the convenience of the staff who's supporting this. Yeah, the, the other consideration too is is who, who owns the funds, right? So the JCA, the executive yes. director of the JCA has control over the, at least the, the signing control over the, um, over the, the $500,000 grant that's with the JCA. Um, and to the extent that MCDD staff is authorized, uh, they're doing it under the supervision of the JCA executive director as controlled by the service agreement between the urban district and the JCA. So a, a, a question you, you mentioned, Janet, I think this is a parallel structure to what the other drainage districts work under right now? Very similar, um, yes. Where is, it, where is it different? We have, um, well, I guess it's 
Yeah, it's about the same. I guess we have it structured just a little bit different where it's just one signature up to 5,000 and then anything over 5,000 is two signatures, which would be one board member and one staff. I think and then anything over 75,000 has to be signed by the executive director. So um, to make it a little more parallel, seems to me, listening to what you just said, um, could we add the board chair into checks over 5,000 or selected board member, I guess, uh, in that first category, just so it sounds like anything mm -hmm. over 5,000, it's going to require two signatures anyway. I and, believe. And because of the, I guess my thinking here is that because we have one in the JCA role and the urban flood role at this time, uh, and that the JCA executive director controls the money from the $500,000 grant, that maybe adding a board, a selected board member in that, anything over 5,000 at, at this time, we may wanna change that back when we get, well, we spend all the 500,000 and we straighten out our kind of our okay. interestingly blended uh, organizational chart right now. I think there's some confusion with that. The $500,000 is sitting in the JCA. Right. Okay. What we are proposing here, these are the checking accounts and the investment accounts for the urban flood district. They don't have control over the 500,000. That's through the JCA signing authorities. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Okay. Janet, we have control over about $160,000 of our own funds. And yes. those would be the right. monies that are deposited in these accounts. And yes. I, I think that Mike's point is well taken. Um, on the checks uh, over $5,000, it does require two signatures. Mm -hmm. And I would expect that if you look at the um, who's authorized to sign, uh, mm -hmm. that the board chair be authorized to sign um, on, on the ones that are over $5,000 coming out of the urban flood safety and water quality district. We could definitely do that. Yes. Thank you. And I guess the only the only other thing I would say, and I agree with that, uh, I think, and I may be misquoting the IGA and I'm open to that, but I think the IGA between our district and the JCA if I recall, is that those five hundred thousand dollars will be spent in the furthering of the urban flood, the success yes. of the flood and water quality district. Mm -hmm. That's that's true. Yes, yes. It's just the signing authorities for the JCA are separate from these signing authorities. That was the point I was trying to make. I apologize if that was confusing. Janet, I don't want to take up time in this meeting with this, but I would like uh, to have a better understanding of uh, this is the check approval process, but somebody has got to sign off and say, yes, I've checked the invoice that came in and everything is accurate and it's against our budget. If you could forward that set of documents on to me as well, or just as separate and distinct from this meeting so that I can familiarize myself with who has approval authority on that, I would greatly appreciate it. We could do that. That policy still needs to be written, but we will do that. Um, normally what happens is that the invoice with those approvals are submitted with the check for the board chair or selected board meeting, board member to look at at the same time that they're signing the check. Mike, can I ask a clarification question since I'll probably be updating this? So currently in the um, 10,000 to 25,000 and the 25,000 and over categories, the specific board members that we've proposed are mm -hmm. yourself as the chair, Mike Weatherby as the vice chair, and then Tanny Staffenson as the budget committee chair. 
Um, and so would you prefer that those board members all be listed in that five to 10 range as the second signer as well? Or should that just remain the board chair for the particular amount of five to 10,000? Well, I'm fine with the, using the same terminology and parallel structure. That makes sense to me. Okay. Um, I, I'm at, at this stage of the game, um, uh, it seems as though since those monies are supposed to be being spent on behalf of the urban flood district, uh, there's a, I, I could understand the concern that you know the executive director in the case for, uh, at least for the time being is the same person and so then you move to deputy directors under the super mcd deputy directors under the supervision of the jca executive director so it just seems that maybe in the circumstances we find ourselves in this fiscal year, it might make more sense for the selected board member list to apply for checks over five thousand dollars. And I think it would be uh, appropriate for um all three of those folks the chair the vice chair and the chair of the budget committee all to get some kind of a report whether it's i don't know what the period is bi-weekly that um uh, of what the invoices are that those checks that are using the monies for the urban flood district that there be a listing. I'm not asking that they be pre-approved or approved or anything, just so that it's transparent as to what those things are, the expenditures being made for on our behalf at this point. I'd appreciate that. That that is extremely reasonable. Okay. We currently do that right now. Okay. Good. Yeah. I, I hadn't seen that report. Uh, well, we haven't done it with the urban district yet. <laughs> But um, we do it with the other districts to all of the board presidents. I'm giving you a hard time. It's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just one other clarifying question on this resolution. When we talk about a credit card, are we really talking about a debit card? No. We are talking about just like a Visa or a MasterCard. You so know, that could be a credit or a debit card. Well, it's generally just a credit card, not a debit. It's a credit. Yeah, okay, so if you've got a good relationship with First Interstate, they'll probably look the other way. But again, we're at the point that we really don't have a balance sheet or a credit rating that would support it. So you know, I want to, when we set this up, to have the flexibility to be able to make an electronic payment through a debit card as well as a credit card. So however you wanna state that as part of the resolution so that in the event that First Interstate says, no, it really ought to be a debit card, that you don't have to come back to us for a change. Would you agree to that? Can I make a comment here? Um, sure. The nonprofit that I'm working with uh, went to Wells Fargo they set up a business account. We have both a debit card and a credit card. We had no money in the bank and we were able to deposit a thousand dollars and um, the local Wells Fargo was very agreeable. So I don't think there should be any problem dealing with this entity either way. Uh, we get charged. Yeah. Since then, we should send Mary Helen to get the credit. <laughs> yeah. and, <laughs> and even better, we have 0% interest on our credit card. We've never used it, but. So, well, I, I, I understand the issue. The only, well, I'm, I'm at a point where I think if the board is comfortable with the resolution as written, we let the staff go establish the accounts as necessary. And if they run into an issue, they can come back and talk to us about it. Agreeable. 
So what is the motion you're looking for right now? Next slide, please. And if I could just make a comment, if um, if we can revise the motion slightly to include um, the floor amendment proposed by you, Mike, which is the um, the selected staff members at five to ten thousand dollar checks. Selected board members. Yeah, selected board members. Okay. And then um, once this is approved, then I'll send out a revised version of this for signature so that it'll reflect those changes. Thank you, Kellen. Entertain a motion on resolution 2020-1101. Hi, this is Corky. I'll move to adopt resolution 2020-11-01, authorizing and delegating financial transactions for fiscal year 2020 to 2021. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Corky has moved and Eric has seconded uh, the resolution. With the uh, amendments, as Kelly noted, uh, any further discussion or questions? If not, uh, Colin, can you read the roll again? Yes. Um, I Ann Grabbit? Yes. Bob Salinger? Um, and then I'll, I'll note that I believe starting at 340, Commissioner Stegman joined the meeting. Uh, so Commissioner Stegman? I, I think I'll abstain. I apologize. I've had some technical difficulties. Um, Court Collier? Aye. Councillor Rickma? Yes. Uh, Councillor Weatherby? It shows it's joined by phone, but might not be able to hear. Uh, Eric Molander? Yes. James Allison? Yes. John Niyama? Yes. John L. Bell? Yes. Mary Helen Kincaid? Yes. Michael Jordan? Yes. Uh, Paul Lumley, I don't know if he's, he's not back yet. Um, Steve Fancher? Yes. And Tanny Staffington? Yes. Okay, that's 11 yes votes. So I think that's enough for the motion to carry. Uh, we'll see if maybe Bob come, comes back or... or uh, or Mike Weatherby. So what's next, gang? Colin, you're next. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm gonna give a quick 10 minute uh, presentation, a um, bit of an overview on Levy Ready Columbia. Uh, just gonna hit on why the partnership came together, uh, who the Levy Ready Columbia partners are, what has been accomplished and a bit on the road ahead. Uh, so this is part of your briefings uh, for this um, and more, uh, more detail on some of these pieces later on. Um, so just to begin with, this is a quote that I, whoop, oh man. This is a quote that I meditate on uh, a bit and some of this work, uh, which is really thinking about the, the power of flooding um, and how it most often uh, impacts people um, when they stop thinking about it. And Levy Ready Columbia really is a proactive um, partnership uh, looking at addressing uh, major flood risks in our region before they happen again. So the Levy Ready Columbia partnership um, as it stands today uh, has about 26 uh, different groups, uh, including the cities of Portland, Gresham, Troutdale, and Fairview, the four drainage districts, um, Peninsula Drainage District 1, Peninsula Drainage District 2, Multnomah County Drainage District, and Sandy Drainage Improvement Company, uh, and then also our uh, regional government, Metro, the Port of Portland, Multnomah County, uh, and then also the uh, state and a number of different state agencies, including the governor's office, um, participate 
um, in, in the project overall. And then uh, really key to this are the uh, neighborhoods, uh, both the citizen advocates as well as the neighborhood association, the um, business and environmental and other NGOs and nonprofits. Um, so this group came together uh, bringing all the sort of different priorities uh, to really focus on um, addressing uh, recertification of our of our levies. Um, jump forward a little bit of the timeline of events and uh, why this group came together. Uh, I won't get really into the weeds on some of the technical pieces, but I'm happy to provide more of that information later on. But uh, really, the genesis of the project was in 2012 when the uh, drainage districts received letters from the Army Corps of Engineers letting them know that the Corps was not going to recertify the levies. Uh, since uh, the late 1930s, 1940s, every 10 years, the Corps would come in, they would recertify the levies, basically say, yes, these are in good working condition. Um, after the events of Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy, uh, it was recognized between FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers that the core being a regulator, but also uh, being a certifier, had some conflicts of interest. And so for urban levy systems throughout the United States, the core basically removed themselves from doing that certification, which left the drainage districts uh, with the responsibility or, or the um, basically being shouldered with the cost of recertifying with private engineers, which uh, cost about $5 million. Uh, it was also recognized at that time that there was shared responsibility. Uh, a lot of the benefits for um, FEMA certification is participation in FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program, which allows the land use organizations, um, the cities, as well as uh, unincorporated Multnomah County to be able to um, zone and basically allow people to use the land uh, behind the levees without providing a lot of um, restrictions as far as how that land uh, can be used. And so uh, that group came together with the different regional entities um, and was designated an Oregon Solutions Project. And so um, that Oregon Solutions uh, facilitation was really important for all the different parties to uh, really find where their interests overlapped. Um, and where that was, was really focusing on uh, fixing these, sort of finding out exactly what condition the levees were in. Um, they have never, they never previously had a comprehensive um, engineering assessments done on them. And then also uh, a focus on long-term governance. Uh, so a lot of what your board is tasked with doing is a result of some of these conversations that happen at the Levy Ready Columbia table. Um, so the first part of this work was really um, coming together, signing a declaration of cooperation, establishing goals uh, around recertifying, around understanding flood risk, um, but also uh, emphasizing the need uh, to find multi-benefit solutions, so uh, finding recreational and environmental opportunities while working on the levy system, uh, and also doing that um, the modernization work, uh, including modernizing the way the uh, levies are governed. And so, in 2015 to 2017, uh, the very first ever comprehensive engineering assessment happened. There were hundreds of uh, boring holes that were drilled through the levee system. Um, these are about eight inch holes uh, ranging from about 40 to 100 feet deep. They're placed every 1,000 feet um, and they allowed in a modeling environment to really understand how the levees would perform uh, during uh, floods. So this was a huge amount of information that the districts uh, never had before. Um, also conducted a lot of outreach. This uh, coincides with the first time that um, the drainage districts uh, co-funded uh, through Levy Ready Columbia really did comprehensive outreach efforts, um, both in the broader community, but also uh, behind the levees. Um, and then conducted some uh, environmental conditions assessments really to understand uh, what the environment behind the levee looked like and some of the challenges for doing any of the project work. Um, at the same time, uh, really beginning in 2017, the governance work started. So a number of you have, were really instrumental in uh, having these conversations, but uh, 
resulting in the Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District really started with uh, more of a landscape scan of what would be possible, different ways to consolidate um, the existing districts, different uh, entities, whether it's the city, metro, the county, or whomever, uh, basically taking over responsibility or going to the legislature and asking for this to be created, which ended up being um, the path that was uh, recommended and chosen. Uh, at the same time, there was a lot of revenue analysis as well as sort of uh, economic development and, and benefit analysis done through uh, a series of risk assessments and creating a uh, in-plan model. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Levy Ready Columbia Partnership was also advocating um, and sort of helping lead the charge advocating for the designation of uh, feasibility study with the Army Corps of Engineers. That feasibility study uh, was important because uh, knowledge that it would uh, allow for a lot of the certification projects, especially the most expensive certification projects, to be completed. Um, so we are now sort of at the point where you, as the Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District Board, is taking leadership on kind of actually creating uh, this new district, all of these administrative things, building out what uh, revenue it would be, as well as how to actually operate. Um, the core pieces of the certification work are continuing. And so that is being done by the uh, Levy Ready Columbia Intergovernment um, Agreement I IGA Board. And so the Levy Ready Columbia IGA Board uh, is responsible for finishing the scoping of those certification projects, um, doing the certification or the um, environmental and recreational scoping, uh, and then ultimately having the conversations around uh, responsibility for actually continuing the design, engineering, and construction of those projects. Um, and so I'm going to just give you a quick intro to that um, IGA board. I already touched on uh, why they came together. Um, but the IGA board members are uh, largely uh, similar representation as uh, a lot of um, your board membership um, and some of the same members, but it's uh, the same Levy Ready Columbia group uh, that's been operating together and has been financially contributing to the continuation of the project, um, as well as having some ex officio members um, that are really instrumental in the success of the project, um, neighborhood associations, uh, business, nonprofits, and uh, environmental organizations that um, to, uh, remain at the table uh, through this process. So just to keep us on time, uh, the work plan for this current fiscal year for the IGA board, uh, a lot of that will dovetail and, and basically be delivered as a recommendation to your board. But they have completed the business cases of um, doing the certification projects and actually have uh, design uh, scoped materials, which we can definitely share if anyone wants to get sort of in, into the weeds on it, uh, starting last Friday. Uh, and then again this Friday, we're having a couple design charrettes to inform uh, the recreational and the environmental aspects of the project. And then this uh, Spring, once those projects and the cost uh, estimates are developed, we'll actually have facilitated conversations around where we go with those projects. So there's options around uh, individual organizations or agencies taking on the responsibility, um, having Levy Ready Columbia staff continue developing the project into the design phase, um, and then some of them that uh, may be the responsibility of uh, your board to, um, to move forward. And so this is just a quick, um, and I'm not going to have you read it here, I think it would be, uh, but it's in your, in your packet. But uh, those out years, as far as exactly where the Levy Ready Columbia um, project and the staff take the uh, certification project is, um, is going to be decided this spring. Uh, but the other continued work that needs to be done is continued coordination with FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers, and that's both for uh, all the certification projects, um, for the participation in the rehabilitation inspection program, and then with FEMA Region 10 um, to ensure that they're getting the information they need about progress uh, that needs to continue on all of these projects. Um, so we will continue doing all of that work 
but I will wrap it up now because I think I'm at time and take any questions. Thanks for that blitz through it. I would have never guessed you could get through it that quickly, Colin. So good job. Any questions of Colin? Again, I think this, this is to keep the board kind of contextually understanding what the different players uh, in this game are are doing and how it fits with the work that we're we're undertaking. So, thank you, Colin. Uh, next is DEI, is it not? Here it is. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Like, Patty, can I just speak one, uh, just a minute before you get started? I, the reason we're starting to address the diversity and equity and next month we'll be addressing um, some of the environmental is the recognition that a number of months ago when asked, when board members were asked to prioritize those category of expenses and upcoming, upcoming issues, um, DER, diversity, equity, inclusion was at the top of the list. So we are bringing that to close the loop with you and start to raise your awareness. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy, for that. Um, so for those of you who I have not had the pleasure to work with, my name is Karen um, Carrillo and I am the Public Affairs and Community Relations Manager at MCDD. Um, I'm here today to provide you with a brief overview on the DEI, as Peggy mentioned, program that was started at MCDD a little over two years ago. And as she mentioned, you all participated in an activity where um, equity really surfaced to the top. Uh, but I think more importantly, from some of those individual and small group discussions, um, some of you mentioned that it was not a standalone topic, but rather something that was embedded in all operations of an organization. And that is exactly what we are trying to do here um, with the program at MCDD. So joining me today is Amber Onaveros, who is currently providing consulting services for this work. Um, and Amber, if you wanna introduce yourself, please. Sure, thank you, Karen. Uh, I'm Amber Ontiveros. I'm with Ontiveros and Associates. We're a professional services consulting firm. Um, we specialize in change management, policy development, strategic communications around equity and analytics. Um, and I come here um, with national experience. I, I used to work uh, at TriMet for 10 years and I had the privilege of um, taking some of the local examples from Oregon and taking them nationally. Um, I worked for the Obama administration for five years and the Bush administration for a year. Um, and some of the, the very work that has been done here at TriMet and that uh, Councillor Bell produced at TriMet, we were, I was able to replicate it um, in some national policy. So I'm really excited to be here and talk about some of the great things that y'all are doing. Thank you, Amber. And Colin, if you go to the next slide, please. So today um, we're gonna get started on a brief background on the equity program and policy. Um, you can find a copy of the policy that the MCDD board adopted in August of this year on page 21 of your packet. And then we'll go briefly over what we're doing now and successes we've seen so far and close with recommendations for you to consider as you move into developing your mission, vision, values, and most importantly, the development of a revenue model. Um, and then we'll, we'll leave a little time for questions at the end. So next slide, please. And next slide. Thank you. So um, MCDD's DEI program, um, as I mentioned earlier, started a little over two years ago and uses a model that is based on three phases that span multiple years. Um, those are discovery, design and planning and implementation. So we got started back in 2018 uh, when the MCDD Board of Supervisors encouraged staff to proceed with developing an equity lens. There's a lot of work that needs to happen before we get to that point. And so we formed an initial committee um, in 2018 made up of staff and board members and began assessing the internal capacity for us to pursue this work. 
Um, fast forward about seven months in the spring of 2019, we conducted a readiness assessment with a small firm to understand staff's knowledge and experience with this work as well as the board. And then next slide, please, Colin. So as a result of the assessment, um, which um, covered numerous areas as far as knowledge and understanding and experience with the topics of DEI, um, we reached you know, an understanding that there was a raw and organic opportunity to grow and that we were at the very beginning stages of this work. So we focused on doing internal organizing and we formed a DEI staff work group formed, um, made up of almost all department representatives and covered concepts such as race as a social construct, implicit and explicit bias, segregation, redlining, and other local and state policies that have affected how our service area has evolved and changed over time, and specifically thinking about how communities have been affected through historic floods, such as the Vanport flood, and what policies and systems were in place um, that benefited others and disadvantaged others as well. So we learned together and developed the district's first mission, vision, values in relation to equity and the first equity policy. So next slide, please. So now we are starting a series of co-learning workshops in partnership with Onaveros that are customized for um, the knowledge and experience of our staff. Um, we didn't just want to have um, kind of generic trainings, but we wanted to make sure that we were modifying and customizing um, learning experiences for our staff to relate this to the work that they do every day. So through these efforts, we've developed um, a draft equity lens framework. And our goal is to begin in the spring of 2021 to develop a year long process for developing our equity action plan, which will have specific goals and outcomes of what we seek to achieve um, through deep implementation of this work across our procurement, across our capital planning, our budget processes and policies and so on. So next slide, please, Colin. And so you can find this information in your packet, but our vision in sum is one of human dignity. So it should not matter if you use a wheelchair, if you have limited visibility or auditory capabilities, or if you're a non-English speaker, you should have equitable opportunities to prepare, respond, recover, and rebuild from emergencies specifically flood emergencies. In addition to this vision, um, next slide, Colin, please. We have identified three desired outcomes for this work. So the first is really to embody equity in our organization. That means that we lead with retention, that we promote and invest in our staff and their professional development so that people can grow as individuals and experts in their fields and that we hold our, ourselves accountable to the promises and the goals that we set forward. The second is that we serve our community in a just manner. So that means we regularly review and update our policies and processes to eliminate barriers for engagement and that we work with small owned, um, small women and emerging small businesses and so on. And then the third, and that where we believe we can have the greatest impact because there isn't as many agencies, both locally and nationally, that are really advanced in infrastructure, um, planning within flood infrastructure and embedding equity there is that we design with people and communities at the forefront and not just uh, looking at property. So that should be reflected in how we design and construct, how we source and how we manage and implement our emergency plans and protocols. So next slide, please. So to summarize how we approach this work in a brief um, couple of terms is we think of it as people, process, and performance. So within the people and our internal capacity building, we want to build an equity foundation. We want to make sure everybody understands what this means for the work that they do every day and that they know how to implement it. So equity is not just one person's job, but it's really everybody within an institution. We also try to meet people where they are. So we all have grown up with different experiences and different influences. And so we focus in on what the mission, vision values of MCDD are and how we um, find commonalities in fulfilling that mission. 
And then we focus on systems and institutions and not people. And process, we wanna be flexible and nimble. We wanna use data strategically, recognizing that some data perpetuates inequities. And we wanna focus on both outcomes to achieve um, these processes. And then finally, under performance, um, we can't hold everybody to the same standards or the same level of accountability. So finding the right level of accountability for our staff, for our directors, for our boards are all really critical, as well as ensuring that we're really clear with the community about what outcomes we seek to achieve. So that's a brief update on where we've been, our approach, and, and where we are in early in our journey. And I'm gonna hand it over to Amber now to share a little information about what we've accomplished. Amber? Next slide, please. Next slide. So, <clears throat> so we do um, change management and I, I uh, Karen talked a little bit about some of the things that y'all have accomplished. And I guess I would, I'd just like to step back for a minute because um, I've worked with agencies as big as uh, state DOTs and as little as cities and transit agencies all over the country. And I guess I would say from my experience having worked with agencies all over the country, y'all are little, but you're mighty. And um, the strategies that you have laid out have really been about managing change and building the systems. So one of the things that Karen talked about was some of the internal um, education through co-learning workshops, strategic communications around, around Vanport, hiring equity consultants that can help, help build internal knowledge within your teams to understand how to move the ball on change. And then the other the last thing, which is really the strategy, how do you operationalize equity? So essentially what we've done is um, you, you've developed a policy, then we have uh, the beginning parts of the framework. And the way I want you to think about the framework is the framework is, if you notice those three goals that were just talked about earlier, which is equity and culture, accountability to the community and infrastructure management. The framework takes those things and is like the frame for how you look at policy as the board. And then the action plan, we, we will essentially work with the different divisions that implement those pieces of work to then develop the steps to, uh, to have the right systems to ensure uh, communities are engaged and the systems to ensure that you'll be successful for when you do procurement with small businesses. Um, next slide. So, uh, one more slide. So, one thing to think about. I thought I thought your uh, the presentation on on the JCA and the district um, around the contracting was uh, was quite quite apropos. So. Um, just a few things for you to consider as policymakers, which is how are you incorporating equity throughout the vision and values of, the, of your work? And also, how are, you, how are you thinking about incorporating equitable performance measures in your operations? And then when y'all get ready to procure for this, this big, um, Re revenue development prime, how, how have you considered building equity within that RFP? And also, you also then have to think about the implementation. You got the light on outside? No. <laughs> then you also have to think about implementation, which is, do you have the resources in order to implement a program like that effectively? Um, 
So those are just a few things. Uh, we can go to questions. I don't want to talk your ear off. Thank you, Amber. Um, yeah, so this is really intended for providing a little bit of the background on, on what we're building and where we're working towards. Um, and we're hoping to be able to bring examples in the future of other institutions that are working on similar things. Uh, but we can open to any questions or comments. Okay, I, I have a comment. I, I think this is just a wonderful initiative. Been a long time um, equity proponent, proponent of representation of the drainage districts. And um, I, I hope even though the four individual drainage districts are, you know, dissolving at some point, there'll be uh, board supervisors to be replaced, et cetera. And I hope we're able to apply some of these um, instances. Um, I, I don't know how many people know, but I've been working on a historic signage project for Vanport and how to equitably represent all the various um, land ownerships of people and I don't think our boards truly reflect um, cool. the history, but we're cognizant of it. And so I, I don't know, um, I haven't been involved in the equity work groups that you've had, but I think that it's important to bring this uh, information and enlightenment to our current boards so that they, if they carry on or if we continue on, with this new district that we have that awareness within us, as well as speaking to procurements, management, all of that. So I'd like to see it um, continue. I just think it's great work, but also to kind of incorporate this into the work of the drainage district boards now. Other questions? Comment? Well, I would just wanted to also say thank you. I really appreciate the work and the presentation. I have one question on the collaboration regionally and nationally. Is that, um, do you have specifically in mind other entities that are taking on the kind of thing that we're taking on? Or is that referencing sort of good examples of public entities working on equity issues generally? Go ahead, Kevin. Um, it's a great question. So not specific districts who have the mission or the charge that this board has, um, but we have, you know, been in contact with uh, entities who are incorporating this into their capital plans or their, you know, budget investments. Um, so Harris County, Seattle Public Utilities um, and others are those we're in touch with to um, yeah, just share some of that knowledge and expertise. Great. Thanks. So, Karen, one of the things that I'd like your group to uh, help us with is really around a revenue model that's equitable uh, and sharing the costs with an indivisible good. So, we're sort of like national defense. And uh, what's the fair share? that everybody pays for it because if you have somebody that's a freeloader, then they get national defense for free. But I, I'd like for us to develop some ideas about you know, how does everybody pay their fair share based upon what they can pay. Thanks, Karen. The comments? Uh, just a comment for me. I, I just want to commend this work. I think it's um, uh, critically important. Uh, I really appreciate the approach of uh, centering the voices of uh, the historically marginalized. Uh, as we all know, uh, one of uh, the primary uh, assets is, is a levy, and um, my grandparents lived in Vanport, and I, I recall uh, hearing the stories growing up of of how uh, that, that levy uh, felling uh, uh, really impacted not just uh, uh, that African-American community who were later displaced and then displaced again, but impacted uh, many others. And so as we uh, think about the capital investments that are going to be required to uh, strengthen our infrastructure, it's, gonna, it's really critically important that 
we continue to uh, focus those those stories. Um, the second piece I'll say is just in terms of an equity framework, I, I think this is spot on. Um, you know, part of the, the challenge uh, uh, we as a board, as well as an organization, as we grow, how do we ensure that uh, we're growing in a way that uh, creates uh, equity and opportunity, both in terms of uh, the reflection of our, our uh, employees, but also, you know, earlier we had a conversation around contracting. How do we really uh, create opportunities for uh, COBIT firms, certified firms, as we do our work? So uh, thanks for, thanks for uh, uh, helping us on this journey, and I fully support it. We're about at our time for this item. Are there any other comments right now? Thank you. I want to just thank you guys. This is it is great work, and we on this board. It isn't often you get to come in on day one and construct something, uh, and and usually, especially with large infrastructure type organizations, we spend an awful lot of our time thinking about science and engineering and the physical challenges that we have to overcome. And, and I would submit that if we can infuse a human-centered thinking into our organization, uh, that we do this for people, and we do this for the environment, and we do this for the people and the environment together. Um, if we can keep that fo focus from the very beginning of an organization, it's a rare opportunity to do it. You're usually coming in and retrofitting. Uh, and uh, so it, uh, I'd love to hear more as your work continues and uh, keep us updated on where you're going. And maybe even we can uh, engage in some of the conversations you're engaging others with as, as the project continues and uh, and we can learn lots of lessons. So I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks so much, Karen, Olivia. Thank you. Yep. Uh, next is Colin, you're back. Budget update, projection. Yes, uh, thank you. So I uh, just wanted to give a quick update on the spending and then um, just the outlook on what the projected spend is. Um, we are basically just drawing down on the $500,000 grant from um, Business Oregon right now. And so that is the entirety of the spending. Um, so as of the end of September, um, we have billed Business Oregon $67,138 of that $500,000 grant. Um, that is uh, largely for MCD debt. MCDD staff's administrative time, but also for some uh, legal work being performed by uh, Miller Nash and also for um, doing public notices and things like that. Um, and so we will be increasing those um, as we have uh, an accepted offer from a board coordinator that will be supporting you, um, as well as a number of other uh, positions that will really be able to um, kind of accelerate the work of of this board. Um, so just for your knowledge, um, the first submittal was from uh, April to June of uh, last fiscal year. The uh, most recently submitted submittal takes us through September 30th, and then we will be submitting monthly here on out. So updating, because we're spending about $13,000 a month, your previous um, projected spend was right around uh, 11,500 on the administrative. Um, so I know this is tricky to see, um, but you'll see that starting in September, uh, based on the real spend down at the very bottom committee staff and administration, um, that has been updated based on the, on the real um, spend to date. And then pulling that across at 13,500 um, and then small adjustments about when the board coordinator um, and other positions would be coming online. So um, those are the only adjustments from what you had previously seen. Um, and then this is within the combined, um, the combined budgets available. Sorry, you might be hearing my little one in the background. 
Um, Are there sure. any questions? This is Charlotte. So I'm trying to evaluate how does that leave us? Um, can you, I'm not getting that quickly from looking at the spreadsheet. So um, tell us the financial status. Tell us about our financial status at this point. Uh, we have 500,000, we're billing at 13,500 13, a month. Um, we make, need to have more money available to us. Well, actually, so with Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, so the between the five hundred thousand dollar grant, um, the forty thousand dollar grant from uh, the drainage district, uh, and then last Thursday the uh, Levy Ready Columbia IGA board approved transferring funds of um, one hundred twenty, roughly one hundred twenty three thousand um, dollars to support the new board. Uh, you will be within budget uh, and you'll be able at this current spend, you'll spend all of the $500,000 grant um, as well as uh, most of that $40,000 grant. Um, and so you'll, you'll have adequate funds uh, to get you through this current fiscal year. Uh, and I think it's also important uh, that some of it, we're not able to just spend all of the $500,000 and switch. There's some of it based on um, contractual obligations that will have to be pulling some of the um, other revenue sources to pay for, um, but we are projecting to spend all of the $500,000, which is good because it doesn't carry over while the rest can. Thank you. Hey, Colin, can I, I'm sure I'm missing something, <laughs> so I may need to ask questions offline, but so you said you've hired the board coordinator. Um, why wouldn't the, the staff time go down? Because presumably that person is going to take over some of something that some other staff person has been doing. So why wouldn't there be a reduction in the bottom line once that person is on board? That's a great question. So it's, uh, it's commensurate to the amount of work that we need to do uh, to really, um, especially ramp up on mission vision values, um, some of the community outreach that we'll need to do to uh, inform that work, and then especially on the development of a revenue model. And so a lot of the board functions um, and administrative functions that currently our existing staff are doing will need to continue or some of those administrative functions will be able to switch to actually do um, mission vision values and the revenue development. So um, having that board coordinator and finance specialist positions will free up, make more time available to actually do some of the project work that's necessary um, for this establishment. And then one more question. Um, um, I know you said. have a I know there's a legislative strategy for asking for the additional funding. How are we portraying the, the, I mean, if, you know, when a state legislator, when you go to a state legislator and ask for more money, they say, well, how'd you spend the, what I just gave you? And so how are we conveying um, in a concrete way what the 500,000 is being used for? The $500,000 is um, based on a very specific set of, um, basically a set scope. Um, and so we're able to report on each one of those scope items that uh, we agree to contractually. And then the important piece on that too is um, that $500,000 grant was contingent on um, the Levy Ready Columbia project partners budget supplementing all the other work because you know, we've gone to the legislature um, and they've helped uh, for the certification work and they want to ensure that that is moving forward because that's of statewide interest. So um, yeah, that has all been communicated um, based on what the scope includes and then how we're spending against the uh, exact scope items. And we will also be, um, we're in the process of preparing our projected budgets for the Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District to, to, to provide to um, the legislature as we move forward for FY22 and FY23 and what those will be used for. 
And one other thing, I liked your question, um, and I appreciate that. One other thing that um, that Colin did a great job answering, but just one other thing I want to add to that is, as we start to develop our subcommittees and committees for this, it's going to take a lot more staff time to to meet those obligations. Okay, we're right. Well, a little past time because you want to talk, Peggy, about um, the exec director recruitment. Yeah. Um, I wanted to give you all an update. There's a couple things I wanted to hit on. One, we have hired that board coordinator. Her name is Kirsten Hull, and she will be starting on November 18th, so it will help to lift the load a little bit. As you are aware, as we discussed earlier, um, we are in the process of losing Sonny Simpkins, one of our very competent um, deputy directors, and she has relocated to Bend, and the MCDD board um, made the decision that they wanted to hire a CFO to replace that position because with consultation with Mike, by the way, because recognizing there's going to be a lot more complexity to the financing as we move forward. Um, one other thing that I wanted to add to this is um, I am retiring and um, I am I was signed on when I started with the um, MCDD for a 12 to 18 month contract. Um, that 18 month contract is is over in April. Um, and I had planned to retire in March of this year before that that came about. So um, I love the work. I support the work. I think it's a fabulous, but I'm getting old and ready to retire. So I will be retiring. We are going to start um, an executive recruitment for that prop, for that position. And um, I wanted to, it's a couple things I want to talk about. It hits a couple things. One, um, I would like for people, we'll, we'll send out a summary, but we need probably two people from this board and two from the urban flood safety or um, the MCDD board to participate in that um, in that executive recruitment. And um, I will be seeking individuals um, who might from this board who would be interested in doing that. I will, we will send out a, a summary and you can get back to us on it. We also are going to need to um, set up our mission vision value committee, what I would, and also our revenue development committee. What um, we're planning to do is get a letter out to all of you with a brief description of what we anticipate those committees doing and seek participation from board members in that effort. And if you can just respond and say, I'm, I'd like to do this one, I'd like to do that one, that would be very helpful for us as we move forward. Um, I think the mission vision values is gonna be critical um, in that, um, as we talked about DEI just a few minutes ago, how critical it is to be able to incorporate that into our very foundation as we move forward. Um, any questions on that? Piggity, I will, I know that you're building a, I know you've already worked on a job description, but you're probably building something that would uh, kind of encompass what are the characteristics mm -hmm. of the new executive director? You Thank think you. pulling the board on what they think would be the characteristics would be helpful? Yes, thank you, Mike. I appreciate you reminding me of this. This is a jolting of my memory. That as we as we um, go out, I would like to do a similar to what we did when in one of the board meetings, but we'll do it um, directly with you. Is to identify and talk about. We'll give you a list of prior of what we feel a successful candidate. Um, would need to bring to the table and would like you all to rank those. And if you have any additions that we've missed, please add to that so that we have, we are able to use this when we start with a recruiter um, in that effort. Okay, gang, I, 
I have one other thing. I want to. Sorry, I know, I know we're time wise, but um, I wanted to address one thing because it's come up in a couple different directions. I want people to know we are working diligently with our our um, lobbyist, Mark Landauer, at the in the at the state to work on the request that we outlined in our $2 million request. So we are working that angle right now. And um, as far as the funding for the urban, for the, um, the levy ready work and our, um, as we move forward on the feasibility study with the core, we are also working with our congressional delegation and we're meeting with them fairly regularly on that. So, um, we had the good fortune of meeting with Merkley's, Wyden's, and Blumenauer's office. We also met with the Senate Energy and Water Appropriations, my majority and minority staff to talk about um, this as we move forward. And um, so we are pushing this in as many fronts as we can to provide the source that's support that's needed in the long term. And I'm sure that those of you who have government affairs groups within your organizations, there'll be outreach to you also to provide whatever coordination you can if you have a presence either in Salem or in DC. So look forward to that. Um, I need to ask if there's any public, anybody signed up for public comment. I know we have one member of the public who's with us. So uh, anybody wishing to make a uh, public comment at this point? No, I was just had, sorry, that my email is just shared there. Uh, I was letting you know, Mike, that there is no one signed up for um, public comment. Perfect, thank you, Colin. Um, any final comments for the good of the order today? All right, gang, thank you for hanging in. This is, uh, these are long meetings and we cover a lot of ground. So I really appreciate all of your contributions. And when those requests come out regarding committees, uh, your input regarding the executive director recruitment, uh, please, please feel free to give your opinions and we can, we can keep, us, keep ourselves moving. So have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.